Good morning, everybody. We want to welcome our friends from the East Coast, the West Coast, and around the world to this month's ASMBS Fellow Webinar. Uh, we'd really like to thank our guests for joining us. I have a few couple um, housekeeping things before we get started. First, we'd like to remind you to um, try and join us if you can in Las Vegas for our annual meeting. We are really excited. It's going to be a great meeting, and we hope you can join us. Uh, the other things that we want to um, remind you about is please get your case logs done. Uh, keep on top of them. They are very important. And uh, just staying on top of them throughout the year is going to make it a lot easier at the end of the year. And speaking of, um, we also want to remind you that you're going to be working on your ASMBS certificate applications coming up soon. So please make sure um, that you've reviewed it, you have everything that you need for it, and you're going to be ready um, to, to submit that in the fall. So without further ado, I am very excited about this month's talks. Uh, gallbladders and hernias are always things that come up when we're doing bariatric surgery. I think this is a really important and salient talk. So we want to welcome our two speakers. First, we're going to start with Dr. Fernando Santos. He is an assistant professor of surgery at the, I hope I'm saying it right, Giesel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and a staff surgeon at the White River Junction VA Medical Center in Vermont. He received his medical degree and completed general surgery residency training at Northwestern University School of Medicine in Chicago. He completed his MIS fellowship at Dartmouth Medical Center in New Hampshire and is a member of SAGES and the Safe Cholecystex Safe Cholecystectomy Task Force, as well as the Resident and Fellows Training Committee. He has a particular interest in the surgical management of gallstone disease and common bile duct stones, and has been the co-editor of a book on this subject. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Santos. We're really looking forward to your talk. Following Dr. Santos's talk, we will have Dr. Jacob Greenberg. Uh, Jake is an assistant professor of surgery and the chief of the division of minimally invasive surgery at Duke University. He is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and completed his residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital. During residency, he completed a fellowship in surgical education and earned a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He completed a fellowship in minimally invasive and bariatric surgery from UMass Med Memorial Medical Center in Worcester, Massachusetts, and subsequently spent 10 years on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, where he served as the fellowship director for the MIS fellowship and then the program director for the general surgery residency. He has an active clinical practice in hernia, bariatric, and benign foregut surgery, and his research interests are in surgical education and outcomes in hernia surgery. He is currently a board member in SAGES, the American Hernia Society, and the Fellowship Council. Of note, I'd just like to mention that Jake really enjoys two flavor high chew candy, as well as very fun socks. Uh, he is my clinic partner uh, and one of my favorite people on earth, so we're really excited to have him. Uh, I am joined today also by Dr. Shana Eckhouse, the rock star and global uh, world traveler who is joining us. Get this, you guys, this is dedication. She's joining us from London. Um, and so Shana has become our Where's Waldo around the world. Shana, you're awesome. Thank you for, for doing this and for joining us today. Uh, we'll, we look forward to your moderating later in the talks. But without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Santos. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much to Dr. Eckhouse and Dr. Jane Spangler for the invitation. It's really uh, my pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to be talking about a topic which is not only dear to my, my heart, but also extremely common. Um, that you guys will be facing. So I think it um, the treatment has um, evolved. There's some new exciting directions which I'll share with you. Okay, here's my disclosures. Um, they are relevant to this talk, but we won't be discussing specific uh, products. So what we're gonna cover is, uh, first of all, we're gonna talk a little bit about prevention of gallstones in bariatric patients and what to do with asymptomatic disease. We'll discuss the role of cholecystectomy, when to operate on these patients, and then cover the management of common duct stones, which I think is really the area where uh, we have some exciting uh, new developments. So as you know, this is uh, gallstones are frequent comorbidity in bariatric candidates. Um, 
about 20% of them have had prior cholecystectomies and about 17% if uh, patients have uh, pre-op ultrasound will have this uh, problem. We know that rapid weight loss, especially uh, after the root and gastric bypass and the biliary pancreatic diversion cause up to a rate of 40% de novo cholelithiasis. <clears throat> we know long-term that these patients, many uh, will require cholecystectomy, although it's not uh, the majority, I would say. So what do we do about prevention? So routine right upper corner ultron, ultrasound is not typically recommended to screen for asymptomatic gallstones. Just like we would in the uh, non-bariatric sector, we, we don't go looking for these. We only uh, do ultrasounds if we have patients with symptoms. How about ursodiol? This has really revolutionized the treatment of these patients. So prevention of de novo gallstone formation after rapid weight loss and bariatric surgery. Yes, the data is actually quite strong on this. So if you look at a large retrospective series, 500 milligrams once a day for six months uh, leads to a significant reduction for sleeve patients from 26% uh, of patients having de novo stones without treatment down to 2%. Similar, Rune Y, 33% of patients without uh, treatment will develop stones, goes down to 6%. So this has really improved the rates of um, de novo storm formation. Tends to be probably better for Rune Y patients to have twice daily dosing. If you only do once daily dosing, this retrospective data shows that they will develop stones in 18%. So you have to get it up to twice daily to get the most benefit. How about a, patients that have gallstones already? So is there a way to prevent them from progressing to symptomatic gallstones? And this was actually looked at in, in the UPGRADE trial. This was a uh, two-year uh, endpoint. It was actually a very well-run trial, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. And these patients received 900 um, milligrams for six months. So what became clear was that patients without... Sorry, I can't even see, uh, hold on a sec. There, couldn't see my slides. Uh, patients that had ruin Y gastric bypass without stones, so those patients that were trying to prevent de novo stones, they clearly had a benefit uh, with this uh, treatment. However, patients that already had stones, they did not reduce the rate of progression to symptomatic stones. So once the stones are present, this really doesn't work. Um, unfortunately, there was, for some reason, a very small number of sleep patients in this trial, so there is really insufficient data to make any conclusions on the sleep patients, but it's probably also uh, true for those patients. So, cholecystectomy and ruin Y. Um, during the open era, this was really routinely uh, done at the time of the ruin Y gastric bypass or other bariatric operations. The reason was this was easy to do at the time, open coli, you're, you're basically in the neighborhood. So um, you can usually do this uh, fairly easy. Um, the other issue was in patients that had prior um, major open upper abdominal surgery, the uh, thought was really, we wanted to avoid having to go back in these patients. So that's why it was much more common in the open era. During the laparoscopic era, this really changed. And I think probably for a couple unspoken uh, reasons. Uh, as you know, the, the ports are not in the same place as for typical cholecystectomy, so this makes it more hard. Sometimes this is actually the harder part of the operation rather than the bariatric operation. It takes longer, obviously, and there's some mixed data, but there may be um, some additional risk and longer length of stay associated with this, but there are studies on both sides of, of that fence. So, you know, what our management has evolved to essentially at this point is that if you have patients with asymptomatic stones, don't operate if you are doing a sleeve and ruin Y gastric bypass. The biliary pancreatic diversion, duodenal switch patients, I say maybe, but probably not. I'll be curious to hear the panelists' um, opinions on this. Uh, for the same reason that most patients don't end up needing cholecystectomy down the road. And so if you're operating, you're probably operating too much for those 80% of patients who probably don't need it down the road. So this is, at least in the guidelines, an area of controversy. What about the patients with symptomatic stones? I think the resounding answer is yes. These patients do need their gallbladders out. Uh, I would say that the way that you should think about this is 
Uh, preoperative cholecystectomy really, I think, is best for patients that you know are high risk uh, to have bile duct stones. The reason is that these patients are very likely to require ductal clearance at the time of the operation. That by itself is going to make this a longer, more difficult case. Um, not overwhelmingly difficult, but you know it's going to be a more challenging case. It's also easier to get ERSP if you need it. And so I think these patients are best treated in a staged manner with cholecystectomy first. What about the patients with moderate risk? And these are a large number of patients. These are really any patient with uh, age above 55. So these patients, I think it's not unreasonable to get an MRCP ahead of time to make sure you're not dealing with an obvious bile duct stone. If that is the case, then you can either choose to do them preoperatively or you can try to prepare and plan ahead of time. You may ask your GI colleagues, for example, to be available if needed, uh, but this just gives you a little bit more um, heads up as to what to, you're going to need to do. Uh, low risk for CBD stones. These patients, I think, pretty clearly uh, should just go for concurrent cholecystectomy. So a couple of technical points about doing the cholecystectomy at the same time. Generally, you want to do the chole first. Um, this is really because you don't know how that cholecystectomy is going to go. You may have a very hard case. You may have additional issues. You may have to clear bile duct stones. You may have to do a on-table ERCP. Um, you may even have a bile duct injury. And if you have that after you've done your ruin Y or biliary or pancreatic diversion, it's going to make it harder uh, and more complicated to manage. So I think uh, even though it might be painful, the coli is probably best on first. Um, I would say you really should strongly uh, try to do routine IOC or ultrasound for these patients. Um, gallstones are a dynamic disease process. And what was true, you know, with the negative MRCP a few days ago may not, you know, still be true by the time you get to the OR. So don't get burned by a negative MRCP or a false sense of security that there's no stones. The last thing you want to do is leave a stone behind and then have difficult access later. If you do find stones, you have to resolve them before you alter the anatomy. It, everything is much more um, difficult later, and it's the easiest if you can just resolve it uh, at the same time. You can even fail and, and postpone the operation for the bariatric part if you need to. So I think it's best to keep your options open. So what about biliary access for stones once you do have altered anatomy? So these are essentially the, the options. And surgical options, um, you know, these are, I've listed them in order of preference for what I think is sort of ideal down to the least ideal. So common duct expiration, um, this really is ideal for patients that still have their gallbladder. Um, it's the most efficient. Less uh, teams have to be involved. It's a typically a one-stage operation. And if you have a patient that needs their gallbladder out, it's kind of a no-brainer, in my opinion. Uh, Lap-assisted ERSP is very good. Uh, so this is the idea of doing either a lap-assisted transgastric, if you have a remnant uh, stomach, or if you have a uh, duodenal switch patient, a transenteric or trans-small bowel. These are both shown to be extremely effective, cannulation rates above 95%, um, basically success rate similar to regular ERCP. Um, there is some loss of efficiency, obviously, because you have to have two teams. And um, I think it's a good option if the gallbladder is already gone, because um, you know then you're going to have to do something uh, more involved. What about endoscopic options? So there's a lot of uh, enteroscopy, assisted um, ERCP that, that is possible. This is done using either a single or double balloon enteroscopy. Uh, spiral enteroscopy is also uh, done. The problem is that this is literally a, non, a long shot, uh, no pun intended. Um, you know, th these patients may have 150 centimeter uh, root limbs. And so uh, that's not going to be often very successful through a trans or root. It requires a team with a lot of patients this is unfortunately uh, the job of the junior ERCP uh, partner because uh, these procedures can take hours and they're they're not completely without complications either. You know, you can you can perforate the small bowel trying to do this. And the problem is once you get there, 
it's also a really hard cannulation. You're basically coming at it from the reverse direction. You don't have your typical ERCP scopes. And so this is an uphill battle. What about percutaneous? Let's not forget about transhepatic access. This is uh, very effective. It does require PTC tube for the patient, so it's not ideal. These usually need to stay in for about six weeks just to make sure that they don't have a bio leak when they get pulled. So that, that's the major downside of the patient. I think this is a good option if you have somebody that's a very high risk candidate for surgery or somebody that has a hostile abdomen that you don't want to go digging around. What about EUS directed transgastric ERSP, otherwise known as the EDGE? So I'm not opposed to um, innovation, as you will see. Um, I do think that this is really uh, an interesting development in this space. So uh, I say really because um, when you think about the other options, it seems that this basically developed in a space where uh, surgeons largely abandoned the bile duct uh, management. And so when you have a power vacuum, essentially a, a, another, you know, unopposed group will step in and basically come up with stuff. So uh, if, you know, if we think about common bile duct expiration as the complete ideal and opposite of this approach, it's actually surprising that somebody would have thought about doing this. And the problem that I have with, with this approach really is that you're making a hole in your gastric pouch. So you're basically destroying the reason that that patient got their bariatric procedure. As you know, when you make a hole in the pouch and you essentially create either a gastrogastric fistula or a uh, small bowel to gastric fistula, now the communication with the uh, lumen is intact. And so these patients can get weight regain, they can get reflux. And I think the problem is, is that we, we really don't know the long term Term results of this issue. So there are some uh, uh, edge procedures that are done in the acute setting. So you place the uh, axial stent and they do the procedure. The problem is in this scenario, that stent is really not fixed very well. It hasn't had time to really form a fistula. So dislodgement can occur. We've had several uh, at our center. And so even though the rates are reported as very low, I think there is definitely a um, probably underreported issue uh, with this. And we've had several patients where literally the stent dislodged and uh, they needed reoperation to really get that uh, closed. I think the long term risk comes when you do this edge in more of a um, delayed fashion. So they place the axial stent and leave it there for a few weeks, let the uh, tract mature. Then you have a more stable tract. The problem is, is that fistula rates for this left unclosed are about 40%. And even with closure, we know that data from long-term fistula closure endoscopically, this opens up. And I think that is probably also an underappreciated problem. If we look at the literature for patients that had undivided open ruin y gastric bypasses or even pyloric uh, exclusions. We know that those staple lines open up over time. So if a staple line using an endo-GIA stapler opens up over time, I don't have a lot of confidence in clipping these or putting uh, over the scope clips is necessarily going to be better. So something to think about, um, is it really worth the risk of doing the edge at this point? The guidelines for uh, biliary access from the ASMBS actually even recommend that this only be done uh, still in a uh, IRB proof fashion. So I, I think the data is still out long term whether this is really the right thing to do. So back to bile duct expiration. So what do we know about um, in the non bariatric patient about bile duct expiration versus uh, ERCP plus colostectomy? So we know that clearance rates overall are equivalent. In some studies, they're even better. Safety is really the same, there's no difference in overall safety. However, we do have a significant advantage as far as length of stay for patients, typically two days shorter, uh, decreased cost, decreased number of procedures. So we, we have very, very strong evidence that this is the right thing to do in the non-bariatric patient. What about in bariatric patients? So this is a study from Gallrichs in Sweden. They have a national registry. So they combined Gallrichs with their obesity surgery registry. And what they found was that Transcystic common duct expiration versus on-table laparoscopic-assisted ERCP, so transgastric, as you see in the picture, uh, 
is really the same <clears throat> as far as safety. It does take less time for the transistic expiration. This is because there's less teams to coordinate. There's less uh, access that has to be um, established. What we do see, there's probably an element of some selection. Um, so transistic is probably best and you know, more commonly used for smaller stones and more elective type cases. And really, both groups had equivalent rates of repeat ERCP. So you're, you're really not causing any long-term um, recurrence rate to be higher with surgical treatment. So just so we're clear on what we mean by bio duct expiration. So transistic, it doesn't require a cotomy, and that's a big plus because we don't have to worry about suturing that. We do need an accessible cystic duct to be able to reach into the biliary tree so that this is a requirement. I firmly believe this is a technique within the reach of most surgeons, especially um, bariatric surgeons who have uh, often many endoscopic skills, obviously have very good laparoscopic uh, skills. And also it doesn't require very complicated fluoroscopic uh, manipulation. So I'll, I'll talk about um, LRCP, which is um, something that's making this easier and better than ever. Colidocotomy or transcolidoco, this really is more of a role for when the stone bird is massive, literally massive. You know, picture 12 giant bioduct stones in a huge uh, common duct. That's going to be hard to clear transistic. This should only be done for bioducts that are dilated to avoid a stricture. There are obviously more risks as far as bio leak and length of stay is going to be longer, and it does require suturing skills to be really good. So, how do we do our typical uh, transistic exploration? So essentially the same port placement and dissection to the critical view of safety that you would use for a regular operation. The uh, manipulation all occurs through the surgeon's uh, left-hand uh, trocar. We'd sometimes place an additional right lower quadrant trocar for assistance. And don't forget the critical view of safety. This is still basically the standard uh, end of the dissection that we approach. This is an example of video of what I call classic transistic common duct excavation. So this is the idea of inserting a scope and doing a basketing of these stones under uh, scope guidance. Here you can see a basically abrupt meniscus sign at the bottom. So the first step usually is using our Olsen clamp and our catheter, we can get wire access into the duodenum. So it's cannulation. Once we have wire access, we remove the cholangio catheter and the clamp. We place a working sheath here near the incision. It does not have to go in the bile duct. When we were starting off, we were doing uh, routine dilation of the cystic duct uh, to try to facilitate entry of the scope and also removal of stones. We actually don't do this anymore. Uh, the, I think this is probably the most risky step as far as uh, injuring the cystic duct. And so we don't do that. Um, here you can see what that looks like under floral. We have very good uh, endoscopes nowadays. So these are digital uh, chip at the end of the scope type scopes. They are excellent uh, as far as the resolution and lighting, as you will see in this example. And using those scopes with some saline irrigation, we we're able to enter the bile duct as long as the cystic duct is big enough here. You can see the stones floating around. <clears throat> in this classic uh, transistic technique, we would uh, take baskets through that working channel of the scope and capture these stones and then withdraw them through that same uh, cystic duct incision. Now, this is where things got a little bit um, cumbersome as well. Sometimes the stones will break. Sometimes you're going after fragments. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we think we have a better way to do this. The nice thing about these scopes is that you can actually um, with some of the scopes retroflex, you can get a view of the papilla here in the duodenum, very similar to ERCP. So they've become a lot more capable over the years. We also can, in some cases, flex the scope up to look at the hepatic ducts. So here you can see the biliary confluence here. So uh, really a, a much more advanced uh, technological capability. We always do a closing cholangiogram to make sure that things look good. So this is basically what we had been doing for a couple of years. And um, we then basically with our experience found that there were some downsides to doing it the, the classic way. So 
Um, this could be cumbersome in some cases. It could be a little tricky to get the scope in or even impossible if you had a small cystic duct. We had a couple cases where the basket uh, with some stones got entrapped. This is not a fun situation. We were able to free this up intraoperatively, but it's, it's really not a situation you want to uh, find yourself in. So what we started doing is actually rethinking our philosophy. So rather than pulling stones out the cystic duct, why not uh, do anti-grade clearance through the papilla, essentially mirroring what is done with existing ERSP techniques, which are very successful, instead of doing it from below, doing it from above. Uh, what we found is that this um, approach is also very versatile in a variety of situations. This can be done with smaller cystic ducts, since you're not always using the scope, you can use uh, balloons under flora. And this all also allows you to uh, attack situations with multiple stones or larger stones that you otherwise would not be able to pull out the cystic duct. So we call this uh, laparoscopic reverse cholangiopancreatography or LRCP. This is a video of essentially what things look like. So we have our critical view. We're doing our IOC here, as you saw in the previous video. So those steps don't change. Here you'll see a dilated biliary tree to about eight millimeters. We have two filling defects. We have a pretty small cystic duct, so really not big enough to remove those stones. We still use the scope to examine the situation. I think it's still helpful to use all of your tools if needed. Here we see that there's two stones, one's free floating, one's wedged in the papilla. We decide to proceed with anti-grade clearance. So the first step is get wire access. We have these uh, dilating balloons, very similar to the ones that you saw earlier. We position this balloon across the papilla. You can see the markers, one in the bile duct, one in the duodenum. And using just fluoro, we can monitor that and inflate it to dilate that sphincter. We do five minutes of dilation and typically an eight millimeter balloon or larger if it's not bigger than the bile duct. This um, is then followed by just snow plowing these stones into the duodenum. And as you can see here, once you've loosened the sphincter, it's really pretty easy to, to push these in. So that's what we call the snow plow. So we can also um, do our closing clangiogram and we're basically done. So th this is a much more efficient technique than trying to basket stuff out. Here we have another case here. It's a pretty large bile uh, duct, 15 millimeters or so, and there's about a 10 millimeter stone down there. So this clearly would not be amenable to traditional classic transistic technique. So same thing, we get wire access. You can see the stone down there in the bile duct. We are getting our balloon in the duodenum here. We actually um, can inflate it to see as we pull back where that papilla is. We deflate it. Now we're gonna put it in our final position. So just these, these are very simple fluoroscopic uh, techniques. So we're inflating now and you'll usually see a waste in the balloon where the papilla is. And then we go up to our nominal pressure and we hold it for five minutes. In this case, we also put the scope down and we were like, where's the stone? So we pass very easily through the duodenum. And then we find that our stone actually just with the irrigation from the scope after the balloon dilation had already passed. So there you can see it in the duodenum. So here's the closing clangiogram. You can see that everything's nice and uh, widely patent. So there are some other situations in which we've used this. So this patient had multiple small stones, so probably seven or eight small stones where you would spend a lot of time trying to basket all these uh, stones out. So same thing, we can get our access with the wire, pass the balloon, do our five minute dilation and flush and inspection with the scope. We can see that everything on our closing clangiogram has already gone through. We have had some other cases where uh, we had very large stones. So this is a, about a 15 to 18 millimeter stone, very large dilated bile duct. So in this case, we actually broke it up with some lithotripsy first, then did our balloon dilation. All the fragments are able to be flushed into the duodenum. We don't have to bother with baskets. And that's how we've cleared that one. So we looked at our transistic clearance rate because that's really what I think is most important. This is where uh, if you can do a transistic uh, technique, it's going to be safer for the patient than cutting their bile duct. But the efficacy 
as you can see in our early uh, experience was not very good for the classic technique. This was about 48% successful, which is very modest. So we started using uh, some other new techniques sort of in the middle of our experience, but we still hadn't really transitioned to the philosophy of integrated clearance with uh, LRCP mindset. And you can see in our last 22 cases, we've cleared transistically more than 95% of stones. So it really uh, represented a big jump in our success rate. This really does not add a long time to the OR, about 45 minutes on top of your lap coli. We did not see any serious adverse events during the LRCP phase. Um, balloon sphincterplasty alone uh, did not result in any pancreatitis similar to what's been reported by uh, the Wake Forest group here, Bosley et al. Um, and what we found instead was actually biliary stents were more strongly associated with pancreatitis. So we've actually um, started using a lot less biliary stents. This is essentially our algorithm uh, currently, and it's all based on how big the cystic duct is. And you can see this is the classic technique typically for uh, scope. Uh, uh, if you can insert the scope and you have a few small stones and a good size adequate cystic duct. However, uh, the LRCP options have really expanded our ability to do this either fully under fluoro or with colidocoscope assistance. What we do for larger stones, usually more than a centimeter, is we still have to typically break those up, but um, we pretty infrequently have to do that only about 8% of the time. We have started uh, for the last two years done uh, residency training that I think this is key to learning these things and taking it just from a concept to actually uh, implementation. We trained our, uh, a lot of our attending surgeons as well. This is what we saw. So this is um, a multi-center training initiative we did with uh, simulation. And you can see in here in the uh, middle is our uh, results at our university. So prior to the training, we really were using this about once a year. So only about 5% of the time. And in the year after training, that jumped up to 41% of the time. And a lot of this was actually our trauma and acute care surgeons uh, who really took this uh, up very um, enthusiastically. So we were happy to see this. So in summary, Versodile presents, uh, prevents de novo stones, but it's really not helpful once the stones are present. I think preoperative lap coli is best when you anticipate there's gonna be a difficult case or high risk of bile duct stones. Concurrent cholecystectomy, I think is, is good when you anticipate a straightforward case, but just make sure to always image the bile duct so you don't have any nasty surprises. Like I mentioned, uh, I'm a little bit biased, but I, I do think the bile duct expiration is the ideal scenario for these patients. It's easier and more effective than ever. And with simulation-based training, this really makes it a reality. It's not just uh, you know, a potential uh, fantasy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos. That was a spectacular talk. Um, I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Um, so that is a reminder, anybody, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Jacob Greenberg, who's gonna talk with us about hernias and the perioperative bariatric surgery period. Fernando, that was a phenomenal talk. I, I immediately regret going second in this. I wish <laughs> it was um, uh, So as everyone knows, hernias are an incredibly common problem in the United States. In fact, um, incisional hernia rates uh, really are up to about 20% of patients uh, following uh, a midline laparotomy. And with the number of laparotomies that we perform in the US, uh, we tend to form an enormous amount of hernias. So we keep ourselves in business pretty well, especially since when we fix those hernias, they have recurrence rates uh, ranging anywhere from about 10 to 53%, depending on what you read. This problem is only getting bigger uh, in the US. Uh, in fact, rates are predicted to rise into an estimated about 3% increase per year. Uh, that has a lot to do with many variables, but certainly the obesity epidemic plays a significant role in that. And so for you guys as, as blossoming bariatric uh, surgeons, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the, the more that we can help treat obesity, the more that we can treat a lot of the other downstream problems associated with it. Um, so as a hernia surgeon, I think sometimes we feel like Sisyphus and I, I don't, uh, this is Titian's rendering of Sisyphus. And for those that remember, Sisyphus was a, a Greek uh uh, mythological character who angered the gods and was basically punished uh, to 
roll a gigantic boulder up a mountain every day only to have it roll down to the base at the end of the day and have to start over every single day. And that is uh, sometimes a lot what we feel like as hernia surgeons. We put in all this effort and work to fix these problems and unfortunately they come back and then we have to do the same thing again uh, using a new technique. So I think it, it, to me, it's it, it really speaks to the need to, to work on patients before their first repair and get them optimized for that operation so that you can give them the best operation at the best time. And so when I see patients in clinic with hernias, um, a lot of the conversation initially is about their risk factors and specifically which ones we think we can modify and which ones we can't. To me, the big three for modifiable risk factors are smoking, obesity, and diabetes, uh, a little bit their nutritional state and a little bit um, their colonization with MRSA. But certainly we see a lot of transplant patients, um, people who are on immunosuppressants for a lot of other uh, uh, reasons, people who've had prior repairs that have failed or previous wound and mesh infections. And, and those are the hands that you're dealt, right? You can't, you can't change those things, but I think it behooves all of us um, as surgeons to, to really work to optimize our patients before. And to me, that's focusing on those modifiable risk factors on the left column. And so what happens if we don't? Um, so this was a nice study done uh, by the Abdominal Core Health Quality Collaborative. So they looked at 3,908 patients with ventral or incisional hernias. Um, uh, the mean hernia width was about 10 centimeters, and the mean BMI in those patients was 32.1. And they grouped them into three groups. So they looked at patients who had zero of those modifiable risk factors, again, those three being obesity, diabetes, and smoking. Um, the patients that had one modifiable risk factor or patients that had two or more. And here on the right side, you can see sort of the breakdown. So of the patients that had one modifiable risk factor, about 82% of them had obesity, 10% um, of them had diabetes, and 7% were smokers. And then for those that had two or more, 97% um, of them had obesity and 80% of them had diabetes. So very common problems that we see in all the patients that we're evaluating for metabolic and bariatric surgery as well. When they looked at what happened in terms of their sort of 30-day outcomes, uh, they looked at their surgical site occurrence rate. So that's um, that's the risk factor of sort of any, uh, any wound complication. So that's inclusive of surgical site infection, but also includes seroma, hematoma, um, any real wound complication. Uh, they looked at their surgical site infection rate and their risk of surgical site occurrence requiring a procedural intervention. So did you have to put them on antibiotics, open the wound, wash them out, drain something? Um, and here's what you see. So with every single one of the risk factors with smoking, obesity, or diabetes, there was an increased relative risk compared to those with zero modifiable risk factors in terms of all three of those categories. When you look at patients with two or more, and specifically those with obesity and diabetes, there's essentially a doubling of the risk of a, a surgical site occurrence, a surgical site infection, and a surgical site occurrence requiring a procedural intervention. So uh, the majority of our patients that we operate on tend to have obesity and diabetes in bariatric surgery. And when you try and fix a hernia in patients with that, they have a significant um, increase in their risk of a surgical site occurrence that requires some sort of procedural intervention. So they found that there was this big increasing risk of wound complications and, and wound complications in a hernia repair generally means hernia recurrence, right? And so these patients weren't followed out over the long term, but if we were to, I think you would, you would very likely see a significantly increased rate of um, incisional hernia recurrence in those patients because of the downstream implications of the early wound complication. And again, those that require procedural intervention, which are to me the worst of the worst or the most worrisome complications, tended to happen more uh, in patients who have all three risk factors or those that have obesity and diabetes. So um, I, I suspect some of you have been watching this show. My son and I are very into it. Uh, it's a show on Disney Plus that is sort of a, a continuation of the Star Wars sagas. And the Mandalorian is, uh, Mandalorians are essentially like a, a, a race of people who have um, a warrior background, and they live by a specific creed and, and ethos. And, and their, their kind of most common saying to one another is this. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. So should we be doing hernia repairs before bariatric surgery? I'm pretty sure the Mandalorian would disagree. Uh, and Dr. Jane Spangler, you gave me this meme. So it's your fault that there's a curse word in your thing. And I apologize to all for using this. I was going to blank it out, but it's funnier this way. Um, I, so I, I don't think we should be fixing hernias before um, optimizing patients. 
And in fact, when I see patients who have one of those three big risk factors in clinic, I think this is a very helpful tool to engage those patients um, in shared decision-making and get them on board with, um, with pre-op op optimization. So this is the Carolina's equation for determining associated risk. It's essentially a risk calculator uh, that was created by in Carolina's Medical Center uh, from Todd Hennifer and, and Vedra Augenstein's group. And essentially, you take uh, your patient and you put in these risk factors. So do they have uncontrolled diabetes? Yes or no. Do they smoke? Yes or no. Um, have they had prior hernia repairs? Uh, is your uh, procedure going to be a clean contaminated or a contaminated case? Uh, is there an active infection? Are you going to be raising skin and subcutaneous advancement flaps? And is the patient going to have a component separation? You enter their height and their weight, and then it will spit out what it thinks their risk of a complication or a wound complication will be. And more importantly, it spits out this list of what their in-hospital and post-op charges will be. I think when we counsel patients about these problems, it's very hard for patients to understand what a 68% risk of a wound complication is, right? They kind of think to themselves, okay, well, maybe 32% of the time, one third of the time, I'm going to be fine but we don't really know whether they're the 68% or the 32%, right? So I do think they see the money uh, more easily. And then if you show them that, uh, if you switch them from being a smoker to a non-smoker, so if you engage them in quitting smoking, you can show them that their risk goes down about 15% and more importantly, the money goes down along with it. And so I think this is a helpful tool that you can easily quickly pull up on your phone and use when you're talking to patients about, uh, about preoperative optimization. So what about patients um, during bariatric surgery, about fixing hernias during at the time of their operation? And so there's a lot of interesting literature on this, and, and the literature kind of falls into two different buckets. There's those that focus more on the hernia as the primary problem, and those that focus more on the obesity as the primary problem. So if we look at this with a hernia focus, this was a paper out of India where they had 156 patients who underwent concomitant bariatric surgery and essentially all laparoscopic IPOM. So 120 of them had a sleeve plus an IPOM and 36 had a gastric bypass plus an IPOM. They had a really good length of follow-up, so about 64 months. Small defects, not surprisingly, since they're doing IPOM repairs on all of them. And the majority of meshes that they used in these were about 15 by 20. Again, relatively small defects, so relatively small meshes. In, uh, in, in their patient population, they had one recurrence at 19 months um, and no mesh infection. So from a hernia standpoint, um, the outcomes here were actually fairly good. Uh, in a U.S. patient population, it was a little bit different. Um, so this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic um, looking at about 159 patients who underwent, again, concomitant ventral hernia repair and metabolic bariatric surgery over about a 10-year period. Uh, in terms of their approach for the ventral hernia repair, so 91% of them were able to be completed laparoscopically, 7% of them required a conversion to open, uh, and 2% were approached primarily open. So they were approached both uh, for their bariatric and their hernia repair via an open approach. In terms of the types of hernia repair, about 72% of them had a primary suture closure at the time of their operation, and 28% received a piece of mesh. The complication rate here was a little bit higher, probably because there was some more open surgery done. Um, so there was a 10% early complication rate. Uh, and then the hernia recurrence rate was significantly higher. So 2% of them had a recurrence uh, in less than 30 days, and about a quarter of them had a recurrence greater than 30 days. Again, likely due to the fact that these were predominantly open type, or uh, sorry, primary type repairs utilizing suture only and not mesh. Um, again, they did not actually see significant risk of mesh-related complications with this, uh, particularly infection. So it, it does show in both studies that the potential to use a piece of mesh during these clean contaminated cases is, is a real uh, option. When you shift focus to look at the outcomes from the bariatric side of things, though, uh, it does look a little bit more worrisome. So this is a study uh, utilizing NSQIP data. Um, again, I think done by uh, surgeons at the Cleveland Clinic. So they did a one-to-one -one propensity score matching of patients who underwent bariatric surgery alone versus those that underwent bariatric surgery with a concomitant ventral hernia repair. Um, in terms of their bariatric outcomes or just their overall outcomes, uh, there was an increase, a statistically significant increase rate of a composite adverse event score. Um, so essentially any adverse outcome, as well as a higher rate of 30-day readmissions and a higher rate of 30-day reoperations if you added on a ventral hernia repair to your uh, metabolic and bariatric procedure. Uh, 
utilizing MBA SAQIP data, uh, they found essentially the same thing. So in this study, this uh, they looked at about uh, 15,000 patients who underwent um, metabolic bariatric surgery uh, plus a concomitant procedure. Um, uh, uh, so about uh, 19, nearly 2,000 of them had um, uh, Y plus a hernia and 3,500 had a sleeve plus a hernia. And again, uh, when compared to the those that had just bariatric surgery alone, there were higher rates of readmission, reintervention, and reoperation for both of those procedures uh, when there was an associated hernia. And then when it was a bypass plus a hernia, there was a higher rate of death, unplanned ICU admission, and PE. So uh, in terms of the overall outcomes from the bariatric side of things, there's a, a potential real negative associated with um, fixing a hernia concomitantly at the time of bariatric surgery. So again, if we go back to the Mandalorian, I think, what would he think about this? Um, I would say that this is probably not the best way to do it, right? I don't think it's as definitively bad as doing it beforehand. And clearly there's some data that shows that it's it, it can be doable, but you are increasing procedural length and, and the risk of procedural complications. So, um, so my approach to this is in general to start with the hernia, right? So the patient on the left has a relatively small incisional hernia. It was containing just omentum. Um, to me, uh, that's a patient that you can perform bariatric surgery on. You can probably perform any bariatric operation on, and then you can think about fixing it at the same time. Patient on the right is going to have to be approached a little bit differently, right? Um, so when I see patients with hernias uh, and I'm seeing them for bariatric surgery, I generally start with a CT scan on everyone, um, unless they have essentially a primary umbilical hernia. But I want to see what's in that um, hernia defect, whether there's a lot of small intestine in it, because if there is, I'm probably not going to recommend an, an astomotic operation where we have to harvest a rule limb uh, and try and work around that hernia, especially if they've had prior repairs with meshes. Um, in general, my cutoff for a ventral hernia repair is 40, uh, BMI of 40. So if they are just a little bit over 40 and not interested in bariatric surgery, I think you can have a meaningful complication or conversation with them now about starting on weight loss medications um, and trying to get their weight to an acceptable uh, rate at that way. I, I always talk to them about the, uh, the benefits of bariatric surgery and as part of that conversation, because obviously I, I'm a big believer that it's more effective than weight loss medications. But um, I think if you can get them to an acceptable weight with medications alone, I think that's very reasonable. Um, but for those that are interested in bariatric surgery, we'll certainly push that first. So again, for small fat containing hernias, I think those patients are really candidates for everything. Um, if you're doing a sleeve, uh, in general, I try and leave the hernia alone. If it's just containing omentum, to me, that's like nature's cork. Leave it in there. Um, don't do anything with it. Uh, and just eventually come back and fix the hernia down the road. If they have a buy, if you're doing a bypass, if you can again leave the hernia alone, like if if uh, if you don't have to take any omentum out of it, um, uh, that's great. Uh, if you have to reduce it, which most of the time I find that I do because you end up having to split the omentum, uh, I think it's important to close those. Um, essentially with a bypass, you usually put your rule limb right over the omentum and it's now sitting directly underneath that hernia. And what you don't want is for the rule limb to get incarcerated, to obstruct, and then to have a GJ anastomosis proximal to that obstruction. Um, so when that happens, I think it's important to close it. I usually close those primarily with just suture alone. I, I, have not usually placed mesh during those uh, procedures, even though I think you certainly can. I would rather accept the higher risk of recurrence and go back and fix them more definitively down the road when it's a clean operation and we have much less concern about a concomitant mesh complication. Um, in my practice, uh, I've never done a SATI or a switch. Dr. Jane Spangler has to teach me how to do those now that I'm here at Duke. Um, but essentially, I would probably follow the bypass algorithm, right? If you have to if you have to uh, pull momentum out and now you have a, a limb that has a potential upstream uh, anastomosis, I think you should probably primarily fix that hernia as well. When they have more complex hernias where I'm really worried about uh, the ability to harvest an intestinal limb, to me, those are um, candidates really for a sleeve only. And a lot of times you, it's amazing, even with very complex and very dangerous hernias, um, you can get around them. Uh, most of the time you're working way up in the upper abdomen, you can kind of sneak your ports in around the hernia uh, and do the sleeve while leaving the hernia alone. So when we have patients like that, I always tell the patients like, um, leave everything alone. In fact, I'll tell them. <laughs> Look away, I'm, I'm hideous.
like don't even look at the hernia, just completely avoid it. Um, uh, pay no attention to it, do your sleeve, get out, and then come back in six to 12 months when they've lost enough weight uh, to deal with it. Um, so hernias after bariatric surgery, now the world is your oyster, right? You can do anything for these patients. So this was a patient of mine. I think he'd had like six or seven prior repairs after uh, an initial x lap as a teenager for a, a testicular seminoma that required a laparoscopic retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. He had mesh all over the place. Um, there was no way that this guy was a candidate for any anastomotic procedure. Um, uh, we were able to sneak in and do a sleeve. Um, he lost a significant amount of weight. We eventually took him back and did a tar. Uh, had to sew two pieces of mesh together to try and cover all the defect. And in the end, everything closed up, came together nicely, and, and everything actually went really well with his repair. So um, again, I think hernia repairs after bariatric surgery. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way, right? Uh, take care of their modifiable risk factors first and then and then give them a good repair that can be definitive over the long term. Uh, so thank you. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you all for these wonderful uh, talks. Uh, I think that's the first curse word we've seen in fellow project history. And quite frankly, I've already gotten a copy of the meme sent to me. So while it's a first, it was a fantastic, uh, I think, point. Uh, we really appreciate the talk. Uh, while you guys were talking, we did have a few questions in the chat. Um, and I'm going to uh, ask a question uh, that was put in the chat first of who uh, of the panelists here um, that do bariatric surgery use Ursodile? Um, and then any issues with cost or coverage by insurance? I'll start. Dr. Greenberg. Uh, perfect. I, um, I've done both. So I was previously in private practice before I was uh, came back to Duke's faculty. And when I was in private practice, we routinely prescribed Ursodiol. I don't think cost is really the issue. The issue is the side effect. So the major side effect of Ursodiol is nausea and vomiting. Um, and so it's really compliance is the issue. They're not going to take it because it makes them feel so bad. Um, I think doing sometimes doing the lower dosing multiple times during the day, but then it's, are they going to take it that many times a day? So in our practice now, we don't do it. We recently actually did a lit review and realized that it is, you know, pretty well supported in the data. And so we did discuss us potentially starting it, but we haven't we haven't quite followed through with that yet. Uh, Dr. Greenberg, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I mean, so we we used to give it at Wisconsin, or at least we wrote a prescription for it, um, and compliance was a major major issue. Um, I think not only is it nauseating and 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 cause vomiting, I think it it suppose like by patient report, it tastes awful, uh, and they have to take it multiple times a day, and they, and patients really hate it. Um, uh, so I, I just, in general, will accept the risk that some are going to form gallstones and then end up taking it out down the road. But um, I think most people don't really tolerate it well. So uh, we used to give it to them. And then if they wanted to come off it, we wouldn't really complain. Great. Um, and then I'm going to alternate to a hernia question before I go back to a couple of the others. Um, so when you're approaching a hernia at the time of bariatric surgery, Dr. Greenberg, when you can't avoid repairing it, is a primary repair better or is there a different approach depending on size, location, if you're having to, it's not incarcerated with anything and um, you're not doing a sleeve? So I generally prefer a primary repair for those. I just take a, a, a Carter Thompson and, and um, figure of eight it with Omax ons just because I, I do still think that um, it's a you know a clean contaminated case with mesh in an intraperitoneal position is at risk for uh, mesh infection. Um, and to me, even though you're going to have these patients losing weight afterwards, they're still obese at the time of their hernia repair. And so their risk of a recurrence and a wound complication is high. So I, I would do one, everything you can to not open. So absolutely try and stay laparoscopically because opening will be certainly more co uh, complicated and problematic. Um, and then I would, I would just plan for a primary repair and if, or more likely when they recur down the road, you can fix them and, and offer them a definitive operation with whatever best approach you feel is possible. I think if you, and then, if you put mesh in at the time, you're just going to potentially complicate the next operation unnecessarily. That's what I've been taught by my partners, uh, Dr. Blatnick and Dr. Holden, um, who Dr. Greenberg knows well. So I, I appreciate that sentiment. Um, if you, and um, there was a follow-up question. I know Dr. Greenberg, you already touched on this, but um, I guess if there are any follow-up points, if there's omentum plugged in the hernia, you try to leave it, right? Yeah, 
it um if it's if it's stuck there and you can work around it and leave it in leave it in because then yeah. and down the road you'll be able to do your thing and all i care about is not having them incarcerate bell right yeah 100 percent. is totally fine to leave yeah so uh as a, a comment quickly for that question the worst complications i have seen um in the immediate post-op period have occurred due to an acute incarceration of uh, a small bowel distal to an anastomosis um, with a gastric bypass um, or a duodenal switch where I've seen aspiration events that have been pretty profound um, or uh, uh, sudden anastomotic leaks due to the high pressure from the bowel obstruction. And so if you can, I love the concept of nature's cork. I wrote that down in quotes as well. And so I'll be taking that and using it moving forward. Um, but I think that's a, a really important point to bring up. Um, couple more questions. Um, any, uh, if, uh, uh, Dr. Santos, if you could comment a little bit about um, uh, any advice on doing a lap coli during bariatric surgery. Um, is there ever a time you would do a lap coli based on your talk for asymptomatic stone? I know you kind of commented on it. I just wanted to follow up a little bit more. Ooh, you're on mute. So not for asymptomatic gallstones, but I think if that patient has an asymptomatic common duct stone, absolutely, because it's basically a time bomb, you know, in that patient. Uh, so that that's the only asymptomatic patient I would consider uh, doing. And then um, I, there was a question about the LRCP. Uh, what size stones do you lithotripsy and then, uh, or break up? And then actually, how do you do it? Like, what's your modus operandi? Yeah, so uh, with our algorithm that you saw, we typically use a, about a one centimeter cutoff. Um, and that's basically based on our uh, balloon size that we stock. We, we stock a six to a 12 millimeter diameter uh, range of balloons. I think once you start going above 12 millimeters as far as your dilation, your risk of um, duodenal perforation starts going up. So I, I start getting a little bit uh, nervous about dilating too big. You know, that being said, in the ERCP world, we have people sometimes doing 15, even up to 20 millimeter dilations, which I think is mind boggling, but uh, I'm not that uh, uh, aggressive personally. So typically one centimeter, I think uh, one centimeter stone or larger, you're probably going to be better off with the tripsing. And then uh, you can combine that with a balloon sphincterplasty to get all the fragments out. Um, the way that we do lithotripsy, that has to be done with a scope. So uh, you can't do it just fluoroscopically. You got to get your scope in there. It's typically either a uh, laser, a homium laser probe like the urologists use uh, that goes through the channel of the scope, or you can use also a electrohydraulic lithotripsy probe. It's actually a um, much more practical. It's a small little box. It can work off any power source. The problem with laser is um, it's it's nice, but you need a special connection in the room. It's a big machine. So there, and there's also the credentialing issue. A lot of general surgeons don't have laser privileges. So that creates a barrier. So I think EHL is probably the most practical, but certainly if you have laser privileges and you can use your uh, laser machine, it's kind of like the, the Lamborghini. That's a uh, fantastic uh, feedback. It, it, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking, Dr. Santos, and I'd be curious again to hear, um, you are an expert in CVDE and LR, uh, LRCP. Um, I didn't learn how to do it until I became a faculty member. Uh, I don't do LRCP yet. I have some learning to do. And based on what I've learned today, I cannot wait to um, work with uh, my partners, Mike Awad and Mike Brunt on uh, moving forward with that. Um, uh, I'd be curious from the rest of the panel, uh, do you guys do CBDE? And then a follow-up question, if not, how do we go and learn it? What's the best approach for fellows and faculty? Very, very oh. timely question because we actually have Boston Scientific coming to train us today for us, uh, hey. um, uh, which we just got into our, we, so um, both Dr. Jane Spangler and I practice at a site where we don't have readily, readily access to ERCP. Um, so when we have patients who come in with cholelithiasis, they often have to sit here, wait to transfer to Main Duke Hospital where they can get an ERCP and it delays their care for several days. And then obviously 
Um, we can't do lap assisted ERCPs on our own patients here either because we don't have the GI support. So we are now exploring this uh, this um, as as an avenue to move forward because I think it'll be much more efficient for patient care. It also obviously keeps the billing within the Department of Surgery rather than the Department of GI or Division of GI. So I think there's a lot of benefits to this. And and Fernando, that talk was absolutely awesome. Um, actually, curiously, what what size balloon dilator do you use for the LRCP? Is that standard or do you vary based on patient? So we always uh, examine the diameter of the bile duct on the IOC, and that really determines uh, the upper limit of balloon that we can use. We never want to exceed the bile duct diameter. Um, you typically have to dilate it at least as large as the stone. Um, and then the other thing that we try to do is, you know, try to at least use an eight uh, millimeter if you can. The larger balloons and the longer dilation time probably leads to less risk of pancreatitis. So, um most frequently, uh, by far, we've used the eight millimeter balloon. That just seems to be the most common anatomic situation that we find. Probably second, uh, you know, most frequent is either the six or the 10 millimeter. I get a little nervous about pancreatitis with the six millimeter balloons. If you look at the ERCP, sphincterplasty literature, you start seeing uh, more pancreatitis with smaller balloons. So um I tend to favor um, as large, you know, as you can get away with uh, according to that bile duct size. Any but issues somebody, with- Somebody just asked a question. Sorry, Shane, I, I, this is, I was gonna actually ask um, about, you know, with the longer times of dilation and potentially a larger dilation, you know, are there any complications related to stenosis or stricture um, at the sphincter or in the duct? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there doesn't seem to be, if you look at long-term outcomes in the ERCP world, when they compare balloon sphincterplasty to sphincterotomy. Um, the other, you know, potential advantage of using the balloon is that uh, your bleeding rate is going to be lower, a lot lower in the literature. And if you think about long-term sphincter function, some of these patients in China, they've actually done studies on preservation of sphincter function and the, the surrogate uh, marker you can follow for that is basically new mobilia rates. If you scan these patients six, 12 months down the road, how many of them are going to have new mobilia? It's a lot lower with the balloons than the sphincterotomy. I think, you know, even though this has not been proven in literature uh, to be detrimental uh, to have an incompetent sphincter, you got to wonder some of these 20, 30 year olds that are getting uh, sphincterotomies and essentially permanent sphincter uh, dysfunction. What, what is their milieu and their bile that can be, you know, a couple of decades later? We don't know if we're setting these patients up for problems, recurrent stones or cancers. That, that's still a really unanswered long-term question. Really awesome feedback. Um, we had one more question in the Q&A before we wrap up. Uh, if, any comments on gallbladder polyps and how to approach in a patient with bariatric surgery? Yeah, so I would say, first of all, they're probably pretty rare, the true gallbladder neoplasms. Um, most often, probably about 80% of the time, it's, you know, some sludge that looks funny. Uh, it might be a small stone. Um, I've not found that most of them are actually significant uh, neoplasms. I think if you have real suspicion, those should be uh, dealt with ahead of time. You don't want to find out, you know, after your concurrent coli that, oh man, that patient had a, a T2 gallbladder cancer and, and you didn't know, you know, that I think is sort of a non-starter <clears throat> until you resolve that issue before you proceed to bariatric surgery. Great. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Greenberg and Dr. Santos for um, the fantastic talks. Um, I know I got a significant amount out of it and we've gotten a lot of really positive comments in our chat as well. Um, we look forward to um, the afternoon session uh, where uh, there'll be an opportunity for the West Coast to uh, listen in with Dr. El Char and uh, Dr. Lloyd, and uh, we'll go from there. Dr. Thank James you so Sandler. much for having us. Thank you both so much. That was fantastic. We really Thanks. appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session. I'm joined. Um, I'm Julianne Lloyd. Uh, I'm a bariatric surgeon at Baylor, and I'm joined uh, today by Dr. Sharif as one of the moderators. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have either of our speakers here with us. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Greenberg is running a little late, um, but hopefully he'll be able to join us and hopefully Dr. Santos will uh, drop in as well. Um,
we'll just take a quick look to see if there are any questions in the chat, because um, it looks like you guys have already started putting some stuff up. Yeah, I, uh, hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I saw two questions uh, pop up on a chat box. And uh, Dr. Lloyd, if you could answer these. Um, what do you, do you guys have a GI on standby um, when you're doing these lab cases uh, for interop uh, ARCP? I know at my place, we don't have those access and that's kind of makes it more important for us to learn how to do these transistic uh, CBD exploration. What's your experience been like? So we generally don't have GI on standby either, yeah. um, but I would say just like with any other facility, whatever, whenever you're in a case and you encounter some kind of difficulty in an area that you're not necessarily an expert, you can always just call um, a consult, like an interop consult. Um, it's funny because while the presenters were talking, I was thinking how interesting it is that there are so many different ways to approach um, gallstones and even hernias mm -hmm. patients um, undergoing bariatric surgery. And I think one of the things that was really nicely highlighted in both of these excellent talks is that, um, you know, you have lots of different resources at your disposal. And sure. um, I think the way to approach it really depends on what kind of uh, resources are available at your specific hospital. So I would say before even undergoing any of these things, if you are considering doing an intra-op ERCP, I would first determine whether or not there um, you have GI available with ERCP capabilities to help you. Um, just kind of see what kind of backup you could have if you needed to call that consult. Yeah. So uh, in my practice, what I have done is like, um, especially for the uh, patients with bypass or SADES or DS, where you know you don't have access to uh, the ability tree directly through the map, is uh, touch base with the GI docs and kind of try and coordinate, especially get, if you get an MRCP and you know you have, uh, you might encounter a CBD problem, then to touch base with them, have them on a standby, um, uh, as Dr. Santos mentioned, this is labor intensive. This takes time. So to have a better coordination is better, is ideal, but over the weekend, sometimes it becomes difficult. Uh, and in those circumstances, Dr. Lloyd, what do you do? You, you go in and you have done an interop cholangiogram and you see a CBD stone. And if you don't have the capacity and which we didn't have in our hospital for until six months ago, um, and you find that there is stones there. Uh, would you just close, come back and uh, to, uh, for a planned uh, laparoscopic ERCP? You're muted. Yeah, so I was saying, again, I would just check what resources are available. If there's somebody else who is in the hospital who could help you, um, that's definitely the first thing I would do. Um, but yes, you do have the option to delay because these are often not emergencies as well. Right. So the other question, um, was what size and make of the balloon uh, do we use for laparoscopic CBD exploration? Um, I can attempt to answer that. Uh, all I have to say is that I, I've tried doing transcystic uh, explorations. I haven't done the anterograde um, uh, CBD exploration and pushing the stones through. My uh, go-to is to start off with a smaller balloon, something like uh, four millimeters and dilate up to eight millimeters, even though that, that gives me, um, I haven't, I've done it once or twice. Uh, sometimes that can bail you out and help you put the scope in, but, um, trans uh, through the papilla, I haven't done those yet. So have you, do you have any experience with that? No, no. so I haven't done those, um, but I know that the GI guys will sometimes even dilate up to two centimeters. They're pretty I know. Yeah, they're pretty <laughs> doing it. So, um, you know, honestly for this, I would, I would refer to uh, or uh, speakers who came in or even to yeah. GI to get some more information about that. Um, the other thing that came up I thought was interesting was the use of Actigal. Um, you know, so during training, we we used it very liberally with all of our patients. Um, and then at some point we stopped. What's what's your particular practice? So like? uh, my the, the place where I practice is kind of a little bit of rural uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm based out of York, Pennsylvania. And uh, the majority of the time, the patient's compliance is an issue. And patients cannot afford these medications, um, which surprisingly are not that expensive. But I think uh, my problem has been that patients are not, uh, they, they don't fill their prescriptions. So I don't even get to hear the side effects of it. 
So uh, I stopped uh, giving them prescriptions now. Yeah, we, we've had issues with compliance as well. And that's actually one of the reasons why we stopped prescribing it. Um, so right. now in, in my own practice, uh, you know, in general, I, I don't prescribe it anymore. Right. And I had a few questions uh, prepared for the panelists and maybe we can attempt to answer them. Um, now, in coming to hernias, we see these incident, incidental hernias that um, when you're doing a bariatric case, I mean, obviously if there is a small bowel you, you want to address and if it's a fat that's plugged in, you don't touch it. But there are some subset where you go in and you see the hernia and it's easily reducible, it's wide base. Do you attempt to uh, fix them or you just let them be? If it's a wide based one. Yeah, I usually leave it. As long as there's an mental plug in there, I usually leave it alone. Um, and if there is none? If there's no plug, then I would try to primarily fix. Well, if it's wide based, yeah, wide based, I may leave it alone. It just depends on how it looks. If I think it's going to be at risk of obstruction and cause a problem for um, the BP limb, as Dr. Greenberg had pointed out, then yes, I would, I would close it primarily and you know talk with the patient about the implications and the fact that they probably will need a formal repair in the long term after they've Absolutely. lost weight. Yeah. And would you attempt um, putting your port through those? Sometimes, you know, they're just right there, but not quite where you want your port there. And would you just put your port through? Uh, um... So sometimes, sometimes I do that. Um, it just kind of depends on how big the incision is. Uh, so, you know, I also am a hernia surgeon. Uh, I guess I'm saying that very loosely, but I do also <laughs> do hernia repairs. Um, so it depends. Like if, if the patient has like a small umbilical hernia, I will consider putting the port through it. Um, but if it's going to affect my ability to complete the bariatric surgery um, in the way that I think is safest and best for the patient, then I'm not going to compromise it to try to address the hernia. If it is a small hernia, however, I will still try to put some interrupted sutures in there. Right. What, what the do you normally do? So um, I use the catatom. I mean, if it's a white base hernia, uh, just let it be. But if it's a small hernia that you know uh, is annoying and you know your BP limb is going to, I mean, your rule limb is going to get stuck there. I try to close that using the catatom and making a small incision. And uh, you, I mean, I've learned that not to compromise your port placements when you're doing these things. So yeah, I, I make a small uh, separate incision and do that. I think there's one more question. Yeah, I one just popped in. Do you routinely close trocar sites? Oh, yeah, when you place. Oh, them, absolutely. So, yeah. So I think um, there have been a couple of studies about this, and the lower limits is probably if you're using like a 10 millimeter trocar, that's when you should sure. consider putting um, an interrupted suture or even figure of eight, you know, whatever your preference is, but to mm -hmm. close the fascia. Um, so for all my ports that are 12 or 15, I absolutely put a stitch in there. Right. Um, closing the patients don't like it, but you know, um, I think it sets them up for yeah. a better situation post op in terms of reducing the hernia risk. True. Uh, so I do most uh, 100 percent mo uh, mostly robotics cases for my eight millimeters. I don't do anything, but anything more than that, 12, uh, I always close them. All right. So it seems like, you know, we had some wonderful talks today, um, but Absolutely. unfortunately the speakers were um, unable to join us, but in their absence, we'd like to thank them um, for all of their hard work and for taking the time. I don't know if you guys have any last minute questions you wanted to post in the chat really quickly before we ended. Doesn't look like any. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. But this was nice sharing with you and going through <laughs> the questions that I had in my head. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to um, thank the ASMBS and, of course, Dr. Shree for joining us and the attendees for participating in today's session. Um, if you guys have questions, feel free to contact us otherwise. But um, we will see you again next month at the same time for another edition. Bye.